Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. You know, they have the pack film in the country, of course. That's great stuff, color black and white, beautiful things you can do with it. They have the Instex in the country, the wide format Instant, but what's even cooler now is they have the Instex Mini that rocks. This is a business card size photograph, instant camera with the film. This stuff is way cool. You definitely want to check it out www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional making life more colorful our friends over at Richard Photo Lab the place to send all your film to get developed color C41 they got some great stuff going on beautiful hybrid workflows check them out www.richardphotolab.com our friends over at DR5 the place to get the most unreal black and white chrome you will not believe the dynamic range the latitude and the look of this when you send them your typical traditional Black and white, negative film, and when it comes back, it's chrome. It's unreal. you got to check out David Wood, www.dr5.com. Our friends over at Iger Studios, Lenny Iger, the highest quality scans known to mankind. Iger Studios does Aztec Premier 8,000 PPI high-resolution drum scans. You will not believe what you get. Unreal. Hybrid workflow, beautiful stuff going on. Check them out, igerstudios.com. Com. Our friends over at Upstrap for the camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder, www.upstrap-pro.com. Our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group, www.apug.org, the place on the web for all things analog photography. Do not want to miss out on what's going on at Eggpug. Lots of great discussion. There's so many people over there that help, and you can learn. And it's just a great environment. Definitely check them out, apug.org. And our photographic philanthropy partners, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film. This is the place that's helping to preserve analog photography for generations to come. You can definitely check them out. They've got some great memberships available. You can help people out preserve the history of photography. It's unbelievable work these guys are doing. Check them out, www.eastmanhouse.org. We've got a great show lined up for you today. We're going to have with us Damaso Reyes. Damaso is a professional documentary photographer out of New York City, has been traveling the world taking beautiful black and white images, some color stuff. It's just a lot of great work he's been doing with the Europeans Project. He's a great guy. you got to check this stuff out. Damaso, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. Great to have the chance to speak with you today, talk about yourself, your photography, and all this great work you've been doing. Thank you for having me. Damaso, tell us, you do all kinds of cool photography. You're based out of New York City, but you've been traveling all over the world shooting all kinds of great stuff. I know you've been doing some documentary pieces. You do some editorial work. But give us a little background to start with here on what you've been up to. Well, I'm a documentary photojournalist. I was born and raised here in New York City. For the past couple of years, I've been working on a long-term project called The Europeans, which is examining how Europe is changing as the European Union expands and integrates. So that's been the bulk of what I've been doing the past four or five years. But I've lived in Southeast Asia. I've traveled to Africa several times and, of course, throughout the United States. And doing all of that work sort of within the discipline of documentary photojournalism. Let's start off here that people probably don't understand how this even works out. So why don't we talk to our listeners about doing documentary photojournalism? And I guess the big point people would want to know is how do you get paid? How do you even get money to buy food and travel? Let's just forget about any other ancillary stuff. I think people would go like, wow, that would be so cool to go around Europe and shoot this, but how do you do it? Well, I was talking with someone who is sort of just considering breaking into this profession earlier today. I was telling him that documentary photojournalism is not a career. It's a passion. If someone would come up to me and say, what's the best way of making money? I would not say become a photojournalist. Given the changes in the media landscape and especially the economy, it's not a great way to make money. But if you want to change the way that people see the world, as well as the way that people see themselves, I don't think there's a better profession to do that through. But it does require a tremendous amount of struggle and sacrifice. To more explicitly answer your question, for me, it's a combination of doing editorial newspaper and magazine work, as well as increasingly a large part of grants, fellowships, artisan residency programs, basically any way you can get to do what you want to do. There are a lot of different methodologies you can use to get to where you want to. 
But I think the more salient point is if you don't know where you want to go, it's almost impossible to get there. If I want to go to Chicago, there are a lot of different ways to get there. But if I don't know I want to go to Chicago, it's almost impossible for me to get there. (laughs) So I think a lot of people, especially people who are outside of the profession or people who are just breaking in, they get very obsessed with how am I going to make a living. I tell people about my own path and the choices that I've made. I've had to struggle. I've had a lot of lean times, but I use the scale in the bathroom and I'm not starving to death yet. So I think if you're passionate about something, you'll find a way of making it happen. And I think everybody needs to take a different path. I don't think there's nothing that I could say that's going to be universally true for everybody. I think there are going to be some people who are going to start working at uh, small newspapers in their local towns and work their way up from there. People like me who just start as freelancers and work their way up from there. There are people who are going to just do the fine art thing. But I think if you look at the vast majority of people who are considered successful, No matter what path they've taken, they've all had the passion of telling stories through still images. And that's really what this profession is about. It's not about how to make money. You'll find enough money to do what you want to do if you're passionate about it. But if you get too caught up with the how and the where and and you don't think about the why, you probably won't be successful in this field. No, I think you're right. Like you said, it's about the passion. and It's about if you really want something bad enough, you're going to figure out how to make it work. And it's not glamorous. I was talking with someone a few days ago and telling them about a trip I'm going to make in the near future. They're like, oh, wow, that's so exciting and cool and wonderful. And heck, it is. But it's not glamorous. I'm not staying at the Four Seasons. I'm not drinking champagne every evening when I'm working abroad. A lot of it is boring. A lot of it is hard work. But it's fun, mostly because I get to decide what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and where I want to go. And to me, that is the most important thing. To other people, it's about having a nice car and having a nice house and having nice clothes and eating in nice restaurants every night. I think each of us as individuals have to decide what the important things are in our lives. And for me, it's telling stories. So I kind of subjugate everything else in my life to that point. And so far, it worked out okay. Really, the bottom line, though, I mean, the car and the possessions and all the other stuff isn't worth anything. Well, sure. I mean, look at what you get to do and people that you get to experience and the things that you get to see and photograph and the experiences you have when basically you could take anybody's car away, you can take away their house, all their possession, all they have left is what their memories are. And you're going to have better memories than the guy making the Mercedes payment that's paying for the big, huge house in the suburbs. I certainly like to believe that. I think that at the end of the day, we're only left with what we've done in life. And rather than spend 10 hours a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year doing something I'd rather not do, I'd rather make a heck of a lot less money and do something I really love and have a lot of great stories to tell. And perhaps more importantly, have a lot of good pictures to share with other people. So I think we all make different choices in life. But I think, unfortunately, a lot of people who are just getting into the field or who are contemplating getting into the field focus a little bit too much on how to make money. It's important. We all need to eat. We all need rules over our heads and so forth. But more importantly is why. Why do you want to be a photojournalist? Why do you want to be a photographer? If you can't really answer those questions well, then probably not worth all the headache that's involved with being a photographer. Even in the best of situations, you look at someone like Annie Leibovitz, and she's not having an easy time of it. So there are definitely easier ways to feed your family or feed yourself than to be a photographer. But if you're passionate about it, there's really nothing else that's going to make you happy. That's true. And it goes back to the thing, look at Annie. She went and bought 15 houses and spent all that money. She'd have a big bank full of cash and still be happy with photography. It's all about what you want out of life uh, at the end of the day. And I'm pretty happy with what I've got and what I'm doing. I think your program is great. Now, here's a question for you. And you've seen this by traveling all over the world, especially the series that you've been doing with the Europeans. Do you find that Europeans and even other cultures, but let's just concentrate on Europeans because I guess it's easier for people to relate to, that Americans are more consumed with personal possessions and all this other stuff that I think even people there that have the resources and the money to buy all this garbage... They're not really into it. So I don't know. Have you seen a difference between the rationale and what people have been doing in Europe versus what you've seen here in the United States? My experience has been that people in Europe are much more concerned with the quality of their lives. 
Europeans, if you take someone who lives in Germany or France, probably make on average about as much as an American does, maybe even a little bit less, but they'll have four weeks or six weeks vacation a year. And to them, that's very important. This idea of leisure and recreation and enjoying what you've worked for. Here in America, we tend to work a tremendous amount, but we don't actually tend to enjoy it. I mean, you might own a Mercedes S-Class, but what do you do? You drive it to and from work. The car commercials are always these empty highways that you're zooming past, but whoever owns a Mercedes or a Porsche in America, because they have to work so hard, they rarely get to drive it on those empty highways in New England or the Southwest or wherever the car commercial happens to be set. I think in Europe, if you go to the supermarket, you can get really good wine for a little amount of money. The quality of the food in the supermarket you tend to get is a bit better. It's more about actually just enjoying life. You'll take an hour and a half lunch in Europe, where in America that's kind of verboten. It's a little bit more about actually enjoying what you're working for. In America, it's kind of like accumulation, I've found. To me, that doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. It's a classic case of photographers or people who are into photography collecting cameras. They'll buy a very expensive camera and it'll sit on a shelf because it's collectible. To me, that's absurd. I would never buy something that I wouldn't use on a regular basis because to have it is, to me, irrelevant. It's whether or not you use it. If you have something, you never use it, but it's the same as if you don't have it. So I've never understood that kind of collector mentality that we have here in America. I spend a lot of time on some of these online forums, and you'll see people post like, oh, I have this camera and this lens, and they'll post pictures with it. I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, wow, they have no idea how to take a picture. Having great equipment does not make you any better of a photographer, even in this day and age. It really doesn't. In fact, it can make you a worse photographer because it can be harder to use really expensive equipment than it is to use simpler equipment. So I think that if it comes to photography or anything else in our society, we put a premium on ownership, but not on actually sort of using and enjoying the things that we have. That is one noticeable difference, I think, between the United States and Europe, very generally speaking. So let's talk about this documentary project, The Europeans. Now, this is based off of the change that's been going around, how the incorporation of the European Union... People can travel free, they can trade free, things are pretty much open. It's like, I guess, being in the United States. Think of every state as being like a little union in the EU, and you can just pretty much get after it. Now, what have you seen from the time that you've spent photographing the people in the EU and how things have changed, good, bad, or indifferent? Well, it's all of those things. Europe has been evolving for as long as there have been people there. But more specifically, if you look at the post-World War II era, the idea that 60 years ago that Germany and France would be allies, let alone the head of a multinational European Union, was uh, almost absurd. Except that Winston Churchill in 1946 said that there needs to be a United States of Europe. So there were definitely people, even in the aftermath, or not even, but especially in the aftermath of the horror of World War II, saw that there was a need for uh, European nations to come together in a way that would make war between those nations impossible. And that's basically what's happened over the past 50 or 60 years. There's been a slow evolution towards the European Union, which has really become real in the past 20 years or so, and even more so in the last 10 years. So as an outsider, which I am, as an American, it's a very interesting process to observe because things are changing. The way that people see themselves, the way that Europeans see each other because there's this kind of mobility that didn't exist before is amazing. Earlier this year, I spent three months on the border of Slovakia and Hungary, and I was speaking with a gentleman who lived in Slovakia, although he's of Hungarian descent. He was telling me when he was my age, he could only go to Hungary twice a year. He was only allowed by the communist regime twice a year to literally cross the river, because they're right on the river, twice a year. And now you can go, because Hungary and Slovakia are both part of the European Union, they can go back and forth at will. And it seems like a small thing, but it's actually a big thing. The, the freedom that mobility gives you when it comes to trade, when it comes to commerce, is amazing. And it actually begins to shift the way that Europeans see themselves. 
when you can live and work in France and you can marry a Dutch woman. And then what happens? Are your children French? Are they Dutch? Are they German? I mean, the lines are beginning to blur in Europe in a way that a lot of people never expected. And that, to me, as a photographer, is very interesting. What have you found, photography-wise, to be the coolest place you've been when it comes to actual surroundings and the stuff that you're shooting? Oh, that's a hard question. In my entire career, I would have to say a place like Rwanda is incredibly fascinating and interesting on a number of different levels. But for me, just every place I go is a learning experience and really interesting. I've been to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. I've been all over Europe. I spent a year and a half living in Indonesia. All of these places have taught me something about myself and taught me something about where I come from. And that's one of the reasons I love to travel is that I learn a lot about myself and my own society by being a foreigner, by being an outsider. You never stop learning when you're in a situation which makes you a little bit uncomfortable. Having a camera is a great way of adapting and interpreting these sorts of situations. So do you find that to you, interest-wise, photography-wise, for the way that you're doing your documentary work, I mean, tell me about what interests you more. Is it the landscape or is it really the people? Absolutely the people. I mean, I'm not a nature photographer. I'm a documentarian. So as a young man growing up in inner city New York, I was always sort of fascinated by the way in which my community was portrayed in the media. Because if you go by what you would see in the newspaper or even what certain documentary photographers would put out there, you would think that it was a war zone. But in reality, kids had fun, we played basketball, we went to school, people went to church. And I had a really difficult time reconciling this dichotomy. And I realized at a certain point it was because people like me who lived where I lived weren't producing the kinds of images which were actually representative of how I live. So for me, it became a passion to kind of photograph people, not just here in the United States, but around the world, more from a perspective of what actually is. Not cliche, not scandal, not something which is easy to understand, but perhaps something which is a little bit more nuanced. And so when I travel, to me, I'm always fascinated by the people I meet because they're different than I am. To me, I find that different extremely interesting because as different as people are, there is something which binds us all together as human beings. And I've been to places which are very different from where I grew up and in some ways also very similar, but I've always found a thread there. And for me, photography is a great way of connecting people who are very different. I think about my subjects, the people I'm photographing, and I also think about my viewers. And my goal as a photojournalist is to be a bridge between my viewers and my subjects and to help my viewers understand my subjects in a way that's real, in a way that hits home, not just in a way that's abstract. Let's talk about that under documentary. Do you consider it straight documentary? Do you consider it street, for say? I mean, how would you classify what you're doing, really? Because you're taking photos of things that are going on in other locations in New York City for this documentary stuff as it is. You're not looking for the Bavarian Disneyland shot that's made for a postcard. So do you consider it street? I mean, how would you classify the style, the genre? I think the work I'm doing exists within a tradition of documentary photojournalism. If you look at the work of someone who inspired this particular, in part inspired this project, Robert Frank, if you look at the work of Eugene Smith, if you look at the work of Dorothea Lange or any number of other photographers, the work that I'm doing certainly exists within a history and a rubric. Part of the work I do is street photography. I'll just walk down a street in Barcelona or Berlin or Vienna or Budapest, and I'll take pictures because there is a truth that exists in everyday life which can comment on the larger world that that truth exists in. For me, photography is very much a metaphor. Documentary photography is not just a straight communication of facts, but it also serves as a metaphor. I was trained as a fine artist, as well as working as a newspaper and magazine photographer. So some of the work I do is just walking down the street and taking pictures which seem interesting to me. Some of the work I do is organizing a shoot and 
and asking to shoot within Parliament or in the factory or at a port or something like that. I try to mix the two because some of the things that I want to illustrate, you can't just photograph by walking down the street as much as you might want to. You need access. You need to ask permission. You need to do research. But doing street photography also gives you opportunities that you would never otherwise encounter by doing sort of organized, assignment-based photojournalism. So I like to think of the work that I do as kind of a hybrid between fine art and sort of newspaper magazine work. But for me, it's all about metaphors. It's all about illustrating an idea, ultimately, which is larger than the simple thing that I'm photographing. In often cases, it's not just a very simple scene, it's a very complex scene. But photography is freighted with symbolism. And I think part of what the fine art world is grappling with right now is this idea that photojournalism can mean more than it means. We've been trained to see documentary photography as being very earnest, very clear, in many ways very simple. But if you look at my work, if you look at the work of any great photojournalist, like Robert Frank or Eugene Smith or Salvaccio Salgado, you'll see a lot of imagery, as much imagery as you would see in any painting. And I think it's difficult for a lot of people, whether they be fine art critics or just your general viewer, to understand that because of the way we've been trained to read photographs. Give me your coolest moment out shooting. The most craziest, coolest thing you've shot, and then give me your hairiest moment. I think my hairiest moment was probably just after leaving college, I decided to hop freight trains across the country. So I was in Texas and trying to jump on a moving freight train, and of course I was photographing the entire time. But needless to say, I didn't exactly jump on the train, which is actually a myth, this whole train hopping. You don't jump on the train while it's moving. You wait till it stops, which is something I learned, but I just decided, oh, it would be fun to actually hop on the train while it was moving. And I didn't miss, but I wasn't able to pull myself on the train, and I slid actually under the train and almost got run over by the train. Whoa. Uh, fortunately, <laughs> I left with all my limbs and toes and fingers. But sometimes, occasionally, when you're taking pictures, you end up in extreme situations like that. Or when I was in a Rwandan prison, and sort of surrounded by all of these people who had been accused or convicted of rape and murder and genocide. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, there's nothing to stop them from doing anything to me. But, of course, nothing happened. I turned out fine. For me, one of the things that's a misnomer about photojournalism is that people think it's all exciting and constantly one thrill right after another. But in reality, it involves a lot of waiting and boredom and monotony. And occasionally you have instances like that. But I've also gotten to go to a lot of cool places like the Super Collider over in Geneva at the CERN Institute. I've gotten to spend time with royalty and politicians and stuff like that. For me, the coolest part of what I do is the fact that people let me into their lives. It's ordinary people, not just celebrities or politicians or famous people but the idea that an ordinary person would let me into their lives and I wouldn't have access to them or their experiences without a camera. To me, the camera and the film I put in that camera is a passport that opens doors for me in ways that nothing else will. It's sort of the more normal situation. The people I meet, the friends I make, that I have access to as a photographer, as a photojournalist. I go to a strange country and I say I'm a photographer and people will let me take pictures in their homes and in their intimate moments. And if I had said, hi, I'm an architect, they wouldn't. That to me is what the amazing part of photography really is. No, I think that is very cool. And I think you're right. People think of the photojournalist thing. They think of like James Knockway and it's always crazy environments and all the stuff going on. Like you said, it's probably much more mundane than watching James Knockway video. I mean, all of that video is edited, just like his pictures are edited. You look at all of the pictures he takes, and a lot of them are not exciting. But that's the whole point of doing what we do, is we distill it down to a few exciting compositions and a few exciting moments. But I have to tell you, the process of taking the pictures is a lot of fun. Even when it's mundane, even when it's what we would consider boring, it's still interesting because it's different. 
every time I go out on a shoot, I'm photographing something different. I'm not photographing the same thing every day. And as a photographer, that's exciting because I sort of I have to adapt. I have to learn something different, and I have a lot of fun doing it. Actually, last year, I got a chance to use some new film from Kodak, the Ektar 100, and clearly they know that I love to shoot black and white. I'm a big proponent of Tri-X, and that's what I use when I'm working in Europe, but I got an offer to test some of their brand-new fine-grained film. I and mean, what did I do? I was here in New York, and I went to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and I took pictures of flowers. Why? Because it's a challenge. To me, as a photojournalist, all I do is photograph people all day long, for the most part. So to photograph a flower and to try to bring that to life was a wonderful opportunity. And I took pictures which, if you looked at the vast body of my work and then compared these beautiful color images that I took, nobody would be able to put them together. And as a photographer, that is exciting to me. This opportunity to stretch my own boundaries that I got through a shoot of this great film. So let's talk about that. Let's get the geek on here. Let's talk about, to start with, what are you shooting on? I mean, I know you love black and white. You talked about tracks. Tell me about your range and what you mm -hmm. dig for film. Well, for the most part, working on a personal project with the Europeans, I shoot Tri-X 400, black and white film. I've been shooting it since I was a teenager. It's the first film I ever shot. I'm very comfortable with it. It has wonderful latitude and a wonderful contrast. It's flexible as all get out. Personally, I don't think there's a better film for photojournalism than Tri-X 400. So do you shoot it at uh, 400? Do you shoot it at 320, at 200, at 100? I generally shoot it at 400 or 320 and process it around there. I mean, the nice thing about Tri-X is that it is incredibly flexible. I think if you shoot it at 320 and process it at 400, you get pretty good results. But you could also shoot it at 400 and process it at 400. You can shoot it at 800 and process it at 400, which technically there's no difference. Which I looked up the development chart and it's the exact same thing. If you shoot it at 400 or 800, it's the same developing time, which kind of surprised me. But it's an incredibly flexible film. My favorite Tri-X story was I was 20 years old. I was in college and I got an assignment from an American magazine to go shoot in Rwanda with a friend of mine who's a writer. And I met with the photo editor. Here I am, a young photojournalist, and we were talking about what I'm going to do and what I'm going to photograph and how I'm going to photograph it. And I said, well, I really feel like I need to shoot this in black and white. And she's like, no, you should shoot it in color. And clearly I'm a young person here and we don't necessarily have a lot of clout, but I kind of, been, well, you know, I really feel strongly about this. I really see this story being in black and white. And she's like, okay, fine, shoot some black and white, but shoot mostly color. We kind of kept on and on in this vein for a few minutes, and finally she was like, fine, shoot black and white, just shoot some color. So I went there, I shot about 50 rolls of Tri-X, and I shot about seven rolls of color. We get back, develop the film, I meet with the photo editor, the first thing she says is, is this all the color you shot? Of course, at the same time, the picture spread ran in black and white, and it was beautiful. And there were pictures in that spread. If you're in a low-light situation, as I was, you could never capture in color. The color film at the time did not have the latitude that something like Tri-X did. So as a photographer, I made the right decision. I knew my film. I knew my medium. I knew what I was going to photograph, and I knew what was possible. And for me, in that situation, Tri-X allowed me to capture a set of images that I would never have been able to capture otherwise. Is this because you had the option of just turning it up to 800 and you had enough well, variance that you could just shoot it and it didn't matter? I think that was part of it. Just black and white film in general has more latitude than color film. It has a wider range from black to white than color does. And Tri-X is probably the toughest film in the world. You don't need to be overly sensitive when you process it. You can really get good results with a range of shooting techniques and processing techniques. And when you're in difficult lighting situations and difficult environmental situations, you need that kind of flexibility to be able to go from bright light outdoors to literally candlelight or worse, indoors. And for me, having traveled around the world, there's been no greater friend to me than Tri-X 400. 
But again, every photographer has personal techniques that they develop. And for the last 15 years, Trix has been my best friend. And I've really grown with the film. And I've never grown out of the film, which is perhaps the more salient point. Every time I'm doing something different, I've been able to grow with it. And that's been a great thing. But at the same time, I've shot a lot of other films, including the portrait films, which the past six months I've been here in New York City walking around with my Leica cameras, and I've been shooting pretty much all Portra 400. And it's been a great experience. It's a different way of seeing a place that I'm incredibly familiar with. And I've been very happy with the result. And then at the same time, there's a film like the Ektar 100. I was never really amazed by a color print film until I shot the Ektar 100. It's better than shooting chrome. In chrome is actually how I learned how to take photographs. And it, as we all know, it's very unforgiving. Ah, uh, the right way to learn. Slides. I think no. everybody, no matter what you're shooting, digital, I don't care what it is, everybody should learn on chrome because then you'll learn how to do photography you correctly. You'll learn how to properly expose pictures when you shoot on chrome. I got this film, the guys at Codex, well, shoot it, try it out, see what you think about it. So I was like, okay, well, I'll shoot flowers. They say it's very fine grain. So, okay, I'll shoot something that can utilize the benefits of this particular film. And I was just blown away by, first of all, how rich the colors were, which is why I sort of make the comparison to shooting slide film. The colors are unbelievably rich and saturated. And, of course, the grain is mind-bogglingly amazing. You can make huge enlargements from this film, but perhaps as someone who does a hybrid workflow, the thing I found most amazing and the thing I've heard other people love about this particular film is that it scans easier than any other color negative film or any other film I've ever scanned before. I shot a bunch of this film last year and got it back and decided to scan it in. And I shot, I don't know, about 10 rolls. And so I sort of prepared myself to have about a day or a day and a half of post-production of scanning, editing, cleaning up the files, color correction, that kind of thing. And that's what I'm used to from scanning in color negative film. And I got this film in, and literally more than half of the images that I scanned, I did nothing other than crop out the very edges of it, sort of the extra stuff that you get when you scan. I literally had to do no color correction to this film. And as a photographer who has this kind of hybrid workflow of shooting film and scanning it in, that's kind of a godsend. What I love about film is that whether you're shooting a film like Triax or you're shooting a film like Portra or Ektar, it gives you different things. If I have an editorial client who asks me to shoot a still life, why wouldn't I shoot Ektar? Because it's incredibly fine-grained, it's incredibly easy to scan, and the colors are great. If I happen to be someone who shoots weddings, why wouldn't I shoot something like Portra? Because it has the extra speed and it has a lot of latitude. If I'm shooting a personal project, why wouldn't I shoot Triax? Because I'm familiar with it and I love to shoot it and it's a lot of fun. And then if you want to shoot digital, you can shoot something like a Leica M8 or M9, which has a great Kodak sensor or a Canon 1DS Mark III or a Nikon D3 or whatever. I mean, as photographers, we're very attached to our tools. We probably have a closer relationship to our tools than any other art form because the tool is really essential to the kinds of images we create. But it's also this incredible flexibility within the tools that we have. You could make a picture using a Holga, and you can make a picture using a Leica, and you can make a picture using a Canon 1V and a Canon 1DS Mark III, and you'll take different pictures using all of those different cameras. But as a photographer, you have a choice. You get to decide what kind of tools you use and what kind of pictures you make. And if you shoot film, you can decide what kind of film you want to shoot. And each of those decisions has an important impact on the kinds of images you make. And I think that as someone who shoots primarily in film, there is no better time to be a film photographer than right now. Because the three films I just mentioned, as well as all the other films that other manufacturers make, you have this incredible range of choice. 
depending on what you're doing, as well as digital, if you want to shoot digital. And digital is getting better and more interesting all the time. But as someone who is particularly concerned with archivability, there's a reason why I shoot film. I'm thinking about 50 years from now, 100 years from now, there are all sorts of questions when it comes to digital archiving, which are far from being answered, that is someone who's working on a project I've been working on my project for four years now, and it's probably going to take another four or five years. I don't want someone looking at a picture that I took four years ago, then looking at a picture I take five years from now and saying, oh, well, he shot that on a three-megapixel camera, and he shot this picture on a six-megapixel camera, and he shot this picture on a 10-megapixel camera or an 18-megapixel camera. When people look at my work, it's all shot on Triax. It all looks the same, even though I took a picture on the beach in Barcelona or the Holocaust Museum in Berlin or the Parliament in Vienna or a mountain in Germany. The baseline looks the same. So as a viewer, you can sit there and you can actually concentrate on the content of the picture rather than the artifice, the technique through which that picture was taken. When I began this project, before I took one frame of it, I thought about this question. I thought about, I'm going to be working on this thing for a number of years. I want it to look the same, even though the pictures are going to be very disparate. I want people to be able to see the work and not get bogged down on whether it's color or black and white, or this camera or that camera, or this technique or that technique. I want people to have a baseline to go from and then be able to lose themselves in the images. And with digital, if you're going to work on a project for five or ten years, it's almost impossible to do that because the technology evolves so quickly. And that's what I see a lot of my colleagues. They're making similar decisions. They decide to work in a particular way, in a particular format, or with a particular camera or film type, and they stick to it. And the nice thing about film is that it's stable enough that you can actually do that over a long period of time. Why Tri-X over T-Max, or Ilford, or Fuji, or XYZ? Well, the Tri-X T-Max is a very good one. I've actually shot the new T-Max 400. It's a beautiful film. I mean, I'm not going to say anything other than that. I shot it, and it was a revelation, because I did shoot T-Max years ago. And I liked it, but it was a tough film to process, and a tough film to explode. It had less latitude, from my experience, than a film like Triax did. The new T-Max is a really strong competitor to a film like Triax. Triax still has a little bit more range. Triax is not as fine grain as a T-Max, so if you're interested in grain, T-Max is the way to go. There's no question about it. It's a beautiful film. I'm not particularly concerned with grain. I've made 30-inch by 40-inch enlargements from traditional analog enlargements from Tri-X, and I can't see the grain. So I think the grain question is a little overblown within photographic circles. But the new T-Max is a wonderful film. I've been shooting Tri-X for years, and it's the film that I feel most comfortable with, which is why I particularly shoot it. But I can't say enough good things about the new T-Max. It's wonderful, especially for making huge enlargements. When it comes to a film like the Ilford HP5, from what I've seen and what I've heard, it's a great film. It's not what I'm familiar with using, so it's kind of like you ask a trumpet player, why do you use this trumpet versus that trumpet? Well, this is the trumpet I've used my whole life, and it's a great trumpet. I know exactly what notes will work on it and what won't and how far I can push it and how far I can't. There are a lot of good films out there. It's not as though Tri-X is the be-all and the end-all of film. I think that what young photographers need to recognize is there are a lot of choices out there when it comes to photography. It's not just about shooting digital. If you shoot film, it's not just about shooting one kind of film. It's about exploring all the different options which are available to you as a photographer. And more importantly, finding the tools, whether that be a camera or film type or a digital sensor or, or an output methodology, which you are most comfortable with. There is no solution which everybody will be happy with. And that's the great thing about the world we live in, is that sometimes when I go to Europe and I work on my project, I shoot Triax 400. When I come back to New York, I might shoot Portra 400. 
but I'm working on a book project here in New York. It's a street photography project. I might want to shoot the Portra 160. When I decide to shoot still lines, I might want to shoot the Ektar 100. It's not as though I'm stuck. Just because I shoot film, I have to shoot one kind of film. Just as if you shoot digital, you can shoot different speeds. You have different raw processors. Life is about taking advantage of all the options that we have here. And I certainly feel lucky to be a photographer right now because I can take advantage of all the great films that are out here. This is so true. Now, questions I have. So you're out jamming around Europe or Southeast Asia somewhere or for New York City. Well, New York's different because you can just pack your pockets full of film and hit the street. What do you do when you're on the road? How much stock do you take with you? Do you buy stuff on the road? Do you soup in the hotel room, at the hostel? I mean, how do you deal with taking your analog acquisition device, your film, and carrying it with you? Do you have a little holster like Nakwe had in his video where you pop it over and then hold six rolls of film? I mean, how do you deal with rolls of film? I'll go off and do a gig somewhere and fly across the country and, okay, I got 40 rolls of film. What do I do? It's a problem. Yeah, the answer is it depends. It depends on where I'm going, for how long I'm going, and what kind of facilities I have access to. Generally, for short trips, I take however much film that I need to take. My thumbnail is about 10 to 20 rolls a week, depending on where I'm going and how much I'm going to be shooting. 10 rolls is probably about accurate. And I take that film with me, and if I'm going for, say, less than three months, I will take it with me, I'll shoot it, and I'll bring it back, and I'll process it when I get back. If I'm going to stay longer than that, then I will take my tanks and reels with me and my film scanner with me, and I'll process it if I'm in a place where I'm setting up shop for a while. If I'm going to be in a particular place and I have the ability and the facilities to do it, I'll go and process film. Processing film is not quite as arduous as people make it out to be. You need a place to load your film place that's relatively light type, that can be a closet, and then you need a sink to process it in. And you mix your chemicals, you find a way. I've done this in Stuttgart, I've done it in Vienna, I've done it in a lot of other places. A great photographer like Alan Chin does it on the road in hotel bathrooms. We covered the primaries in the election last year doing that way. He's done it in China. It really depends on how fast you want to turn around your film. For me, it's usually not necessary to turn it around particularly quickly, at least with my black and white film, because I'm working on a personal project. But if you happen to be shooting color, I mean, if you're in the Western world, you can get that process, especially if you're shooting color negative, which is one of the great selling points of a film like Portra or Ektar. You can process that almost any lab anywhere in the world. These days, almost every lab anywhere in the world will actually do the scans for you as well. So you really have to kind of adapt your workflow to what you're doing and, more importantly, why you're doing it. For my next trip I'm taking, I probably won't take all of my processing and scanning gear with me because I don't need to. I don't need to turn it around particularly quickly. For me, I actually enjoy focusing on the taking of the pictures. I don't need to spend the time while I'm in the field focusing on processing and scanning and editing and posting new stuff to my website. I can do that when I get back. But if I were going to be gone for a little bit longer, I probably would take that stuff and make the time while I was shooting. Just like when you shoot digital, you have to make the time to do your raw processing workflow and all of those things. So no matter what you're shooting as a photographer, there is post-production digital or film. There are digital images that I take months to process because I just never get around to taking the time to process editing it and posting it or sending it. And the same thing happens with me with film. You have to decide what kind of workflow you want. If I'm getting paid from a magazine and they need images next week, then that's going to affect how I shoot. If I'm on vacation or if I'm shooting a personal project, then that's also going to affect what workflow methodology I pick. But speaking from experience, I can say that there's no problem with shooting film and processing it on the road. I've done it. You just have to make the time and plan ahead to do it. Real quick here, let's chat about gear. You shoot like a you're a rangefinder guy. I have become a rangefinder guy, yes, over the past few and a half years or so. What made you go rangefinder boy instead of SLR? It's a funny story. It's part of my long-term project, the Europeans. I was living in Germany at the time. 
I decided, oh, well, I'm here in Germany. I might as well go and photograph at the Leica camera factory because it's kind of like an old school tradition and it's kind of a fading tradition, this sort of handcrafted camera. And, you know, I, I knew about Leica. But at that point, I kind of felt like Leica was like a Ferrari. It'd be nice to have if you have the money, but you don't need it to get from point A to point B. That was my understanding of that brand and those cameras. What did you shoot prior than going to Rangefinder uh, Land? Canon SLRs. So one N, one Vs, whatever would hold the roll of film, lay it down. It's all good. Basically, <laughs> yeah. And I was shot them for about 10 years. I was very comfortable with the Canon cameras. I enjoyed them. And then I went to Solms, Germany. It's kind of like an atheist going to the Vatican and becoming Catholic. I went there and I kind of saw how much care and effort they put into building their cameras and lenses. It sort of dawned on me that, wow, this is a precision, high-quality machine that will last longer than I will. And definitely more importantly was the fact that they're small, they're quiet, and they're light. My favorite story, as I was saying earlier, I went to CERN, the particle physics research laboratory just outside of Geneva in Switzerland, and I had my small camera bag with me, which had two film SLRs, one digital SLR, four lenses, and a bunch of film with me. It's a research lab, and I happened to be somewhere where they had a scale. I was like, oh, I weigh my camera rig. I wonder how much all this stuff weighs. I was just kind of heavy. I put it on the scale, and the scale said 12 kilos, which is like 26 or 28 pounds. And I just said to myself, you know what? This isn't working for me anymore. This makes no sense whatsoever to be carrying around this much weight for 8 or 10 or 12 hours a day, there's got to be a better way of doing it. And part of the reason why I love shooting with Leica cameras is the fact that you put a Leica next to a, a Canon or a Nikon or a Pentax or a Sony or whatever, and it's smaller, it's lighter, it's easier to carry. I'm not 18 years old anymore. I'm not that old either. But at the same time, for me, there's no macho thing of seeing how much camera gear I can possibly carry. And, of course, you happen to be shooting Leica lenses. They're the sharpest optics you can get for 35-millimeter cameras. So if that's something that you're particularly fascinated with, which I'm not because I'm shooting tri after all, but they're very fine cameras. And I figure, well, if I'm going to shoot film, I might as well shoot good cameras as well. And for me, it was sort of a natural evolution to a format that I'm more comfortable with. I've been happy kind of ever since. It's definitely not something I regretted, but I would never shoot a Leica if I was shooting fast action sport. It's a camera which, for what I do in particular, documentary photojournalism, is particularly ideally suited. For other people, it might not be as well suited. But it's the same thing. It's like I shoot Triax for a very particular reason. I shoot Leica cameras for a very particular reason. These are the tools that I've discovered as an artist and as a photojournalist which best suit what I want to produce. And other people are going to make other choices. Other people are going to say, I want to shoot a DSLR, or I want to shoot a different kind of film. And that's the discovery we all have to make as photographers, is what the equipment combination that's best going to produce the images that we want. And as photographers, that might change from shoot to shoot, or year to year, or decade to decade. So if you had one body and one piece of glass, what would it be? Oh, well, that's easy. Like an M6 TTL and a 50 millimeter similar F1.4. So M6 and the 50, very interesting. Yeah, well, the M6 is the last camera you can shoot without batteries at all the shutter speeds. So I've been in a situation where my batteries conked out on me. And it's nice to be able to keep shooting even if you don't have a light meter. Or if you're like me, use an external light meter, it's irrelevant. But no, the M6 is the camera I have. And the 50 millimeter from Alux is a beautiful lens. You can shoot it at f1.4, which I shoot a lot of low light situations. You pair those two things with film like Triax, and you get pretty amazing stuff. I mean, that's the funny thing uh, talking with you is that over my career, I started shooting very wide. When I was in college, I was shooting with a 20 millimeter lens. And then for about 8 to 10 years, I was shooting primarily with a 24 millimeter lens. And then a couple of years ago, when I made the shift to rangefinders, I shifted to a 35 millimeter lens. And then just in the past year, I shifted to the 50. 
it's just been an evolution as a photographer that I've discovered that at one point in my career, it was the Canon EOS 3 and the 24 millimeter 1.4L lens, which was the thing that I could use better than anything else. Six years later, it's the Leica M6 and the 50 millimeter Simulus. As photographers, we should never stop growing. We should never stop evolving. And one of the things that I love to see is when I go back to my alma mater of NYU, is I see people who are 10 years younger than I am, and they're walking around with Leicas loaded with triads. And to me, that's kind of surprising that these people who have sort of grown up digitally, they're finding the advantages of shooting analog. And there are advantages to shooting analog, and there are advantages to shooting digital. But as photographers, we should be always open to the tools that are out there. Because it's not about being a fanatic of a particular film or a particular camera. It's about being open to the tools which are best allow us to communicate the ideas and the vision that we have as photographers. And that's what I've discovered in my own personal evolution as a photojournalist. And what's your favorite soup? D76 straight. Cool. It's uh, what I've been using for my whole life. I'm starting to think about using pre-wash. That's about it. But now I'm curious about this newfangled HC-110, some of these other processing techniques. But you get to using a particular methodology, and it's really hard to break out of that. But I'm hoping to do some experimentation in the coming years about that. But you find a combination that works for you, it's hard to break out of that, I have to say. At least when it comes to darkroom technique for me. With other things, I'm a lot more flexible, but I love my D76. No, it's great stuff and very cool. So tell us where can we find out more information about your work, the Europeans, the photos you've been shooting, and just what you're up to. Do you have a blog? Where can people go? Find out about what you're doing, buddy. No, I definitely have a blog. You can visit Damaso, D-A-M-A-S-O dot com slash blog. And I have a daily blog with sort of a picture of the day, which is taken from my wide archives from around the world. And you can sort of keep track of what I'm doing there. And then the Europeans.net is my personal project website, and you can see pictures from around Europe. And there's a blog on there as well, which is talking about what I'm doing while I'm working on my project. So those are probably the two best ways to see my work and to get in touch with me. No, this is great work, and I do appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Great insight with what you've been doing and just beautiful photography. And it's very cool to see someone with as much passion as you have about photography, This is great stuff, buddy. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. Well, there you go. Damaso Reyes. Beautiful work from Damaso. What a great guy. He's doing such fabulous work, documenting all of these great stories and issues across Europe, Southeast Asia, the United States. He's just a great guy. you got to check out his website. It's beautiful stuff. I've been your host, Scott Shepard, here on Inside Analog Photo. And Inside Analog Photo, of course, has been brought to you by Fujifilm over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. Richard Photo Lab at richardphotolab.com. DR5 for fabulous black and white chrome at dr5.com. Our friends over at Iger Studios at igerstudios.com. Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. Our media partners at the Analog Photography User Group at www.apug.org. And our photographic philanthropy partners, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film over at www.eastmanhouse.org. I've been your host, Scott Shepard. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography. 